Welcome to African Affairs, a DCTV program on Africa in Washington, D.C., United States of America. Today, we are honored uh, with the presence of His Excellency Chukwemeka Odumegu Ojuko. He is our special guest tonight. Chukwemeka Odumegu Ojuko was the former military governor of the Eastern Group of Provinces, which we call Eastern Region. Now, this eastern group of provinces, or what you call eastern region, have been divided into these states, Anambara, Ebony, Akwaibom, Rivers, Bielsa, Imo, Abia, and Cross River states. His Excellency later became the head of state of the Independent Republic of Biafra. Now, he has been duly coronated as Ez Igbo, that is the paramount leader of Igbo land. That is, of all Igbo districts in Nigeria. He graduated from Edson College and from Oxford University in England with master's degree in history. Your Excellency, welcome to our program. Thank you very much, Professor. I'm particularly happy to be with you this evening. Thank you. The questions we are going to ask, I'm going to ask it. Number one, a lot have been written about the 15th of January 1966 coup. The most erroneous being that it was an evil coup, which gave the houses or the northern Muslims the pretext to attack the Igbos. Please, enlighten the world on events of the January 19, January 15, 1966 coup. Who carried out the coup and for what reasons? Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to try and enlighten people on this coup that seems to be at the center of uh, subsequent problems in Nigeria. The coup of January 15th, 1966 was actually led by Major Ifajuna, and he commanded the activities in the south. And uh, Zogo, another major, uh, coordinated the northern side of it in, from Kaduna. The reason for the coup, if you remember, Nigeria became independent in 1960. We had a government, a quasi Westminster type government with uh, a parliament and a ceremonial president uh, reflecting, as it were, the Queen of Great Britain. Uh, that was Dr. Namdi Azikiwe, and uh, Tafar Balewa was the president from the north. Now, the real problem with Nigeria has always been the imbalance of the federation that was, is and was known as Nigeria. Um, I remember when I was at school, I was taught that the great thing about it, uh, a federation was that no federating unit should ever be preponderant over any, I mean, the others. As it happened, the Nigerian Federation, when it was created, was, as it was given down to Nigerians from London. And that federation contained the imbalance of the North being preponderant, in fact, over the two other sides, the West and the East. And this created, right from the first day, a certain degree of friction. The North could dictate, and the South whichever part of the South 
could just complain if it's not in accord with what the North wished. The first few years of independence were not too bad, but there were a lot of um, unfulfilled ambitions of the Nigerians because in those days we thought that once you got independence, you were free and everything worked and you joined the higher league of nations uh, internationally discussing what went on. In fact, to Nigerians it looked as though, and indeed they, uh, they tended to show that independence in itself was the achievement. Now Nigeria was free, of course, we're a member of the world. Instead of looking upon it as the beginning of our journey to nationhood. And I say this, and I want to under, underscore it, Nigeria was not, has never been a nation. We had the aspiration, hopes that Nigeria one day would become a nation. And that has been elusive up till today. The reason being that unfor most unfortunately, the powers in Nigeria were concentrated in the hands of the North, which was preponderant and wrongly so. At independence, we hoped we would be, in fact, the three leaders of the country had different notions of independence. There was the actual leader of the struggle for independence, Dr. Namdi Azukiwe, who rightly thought that independence now created, as it were, a beginning but that we were already a nation and we were now finding our positions in his own philosophical, political uh, beliefs in Pan-Africanism. So we just had to move in into the broad continental alliance. Um, the North, under the Sardana of Sokoto, whose agent was the Prime Minister Tafar Balewa, felt that the Nigerian nation one had to tread very slowly because he saw and they saw a great deal of inequities in Nigeria and perhaps the most important then was the level of education between the North and the South. And therefore, that affected, of course, the position of the North or Northerners in the bureaucracy of Nigeria. Um, <coughs> the Sardana and the people of the North got down to trying to build up the North taking everything they could from the Federation to build up the North to a position in their minds of equality between themselves intellectually and the rest of Nigeria. The West under Chief Obafemi Awolowo thought likewise and took the position of consolidating the West so as to ensure that at a given time, the West would then emerge superior to either the North or the East. Again, let me go back to the problem of the East. The East entered independence, having accepted that the nation was already there, naturally, the concept of nationhood implied a great deal of sacrifice by the East at all points. First sacrifice, the non-emergence of um, Dr. Azukiwe as the first um, executive uh, uh, leader 
of Nigeria. He vacated the place. He made the sacrifice so that the North could be accommodated. Second, oh, very simple. During the constitutional conferences, independence was offered Nigeria before 1960. But to be able to accommodate the North that Dr. Ezeki we believe was already part of a nation, we got this rather odd situation where a nationalist refused independence to wait for the North and so on. Yet, your question, sir, was what? the question of the reason for the, for the coup. So let me go into it. The teething problems of Nigeria after 1960, the independence, manifested itself in a number of ways. Um, there was a friction over the preponderance of the North. There was uh, certain difficulties about religious uh, beliefs in the country. There was corruption, bad administration, and so on. But the real problem came from the West, which by 1966 was really in turmoil. And the reason was quite a simple one. Where does a leader lead from? In the north, the Sardana led from Kaduna, in the north. His agent was in the south, prime minister. Awolowo for the west believed his position was better and he would be more, have greater effect on Nigeria if he ruled from the federation. So he looked towards Lagos. Lagos. And his deputy, Akintola, he was quite prepared to leave the West too. What a funny thing happened during the, independent, uh, during the uh, election. A funny thing happened. Dr. Zikiwe, who also opted for the Federation, won the election in the West. And it now looked as though the Igbo, uh, an Igbo man was ruling in the East, ruling in the Midwest, and about to rule in the West. In the West. And this was not acceptable to the West. We uh, started our problems there, because overnight, the um, victory of the NCNC in the West was nullified by a number of Yorubas crossing from one from the government to the opposition side and creating a new government. And this actually is at the foundation of the distrust between the Ibus still now and the Yorubas. Now Law and order broke down in the West in the, after the second election. There was so much rigging. In fact, BBC had this rather wonderful statement. It said that men became pregnant over, overnight with votes. <laughs> because, you know, we wear mm -hmm. these uh, huge robes, and uh, you can stuff as many ballot papers inside them. And, uh, as a result of that, and because by then Awolowo was in jail for treasonable felony, felony, it was felt that the North used its powers to ensure that Akintola, who became their stooge, won the election. It became very dangerous to travel around the streets of Lagos or the West anywhere. 
that's when they started throwing acid at people in the streets, in your car, uh, the phenomenon known as wet year. That is wet in wet year. Um, throwing acid on people. And it was to halt this, actually, that the military was felt pulled out of barracks to help stabilize the situation. And this went on. We were not moving anywhere. The countries were becoming independent. Uh, we were seeing uh, Julius Nyerere creating uh, personality in Africa, Nkrumah there, and so on. Nigeria's big, and with all the promise of independence, was clearly doing nothing. It was then that a group of young officers, now let's get it straight. The young officers had within Igbos, Yorubas, and Hausas. The way the Nigerian army was structured, you could not escape a preponderance of Igbo um, officers. And these were at the middle level because they were essentially majors. By then, I was a lieutenant colonel, so not, I wasn't part of it. I was then commanding a battalion in Kano. The coup took place ostensibly, because I later found out that the whole aim of the coup was to halt this apparent drift in Nigeria. But significantly, you know what they wanted to do? To create a presidential commission of army officers as a safeguard to the people who would guard the nation and hand over government to Chief Obafemi Awolowo. The idea was to release him from prison, make him prime minister, and in the hope that Nigeria would become a better place. That is actually how. So it was really the Yorubas and their leader that were going to benefit oh, from, absolutely. from the could not the insinuation that it was an evil coup. No, certainly not. Okay. Certainly. Your Excellency, we have And not only that, and I think it's, I think, because a lot of things have been said about this. Yes. Who actually halted the coup? Aguero in Lagos, an Igbo. Emekod Megu Juku in Kano, an Igbo. The Igbos halted the coup. How can it be at the same time an Igbo coup halted by Igbos? There's something odd about that. Thank you, Your Excellency. The next question is, on, the ten, on May 29th, July 29th, September 29th, 1966, genocide was committed against the Igbos. Will you let the world, through this medium, know the extent of this genocide. We know you established the Onyuke Commission that looked into these genocidal acts. What were his findings, some of them that you can let the world know? Well, that's not that. I mean, the findings, the report. OK, the report. The report is available, can be bought by anyone. It's been circulated all over Nigeria. It's, it's not hidden. The first massacre of Igbos in the north, we could, in that report, it was stated that the first coup was 50,000. Then, later in the same year, the universal massacre that took place across the whole of Nigeria, in, uh, including the north and parts of the west, we're talking in terms of uh, 700,000 killed. <laughs> so if, if its figures were looking into, certainly they were very heavy. Well, we but are... when we're talking of genocide, it's intent that really matters. What was the aim of that? And the, it was very simple, and the language might make people shudder or remember. It was to impose the final solution to the Igbo problem in Nigeria. That is, when there are no more Igbos in Nigeria, 
then there will be no problem. I think if one th thinks back, sometimes you will know who used that term, referring to who. Was the element of religion involved? Uh, there are three areas that came together. There was certainly the ethnic one. There was at the same time <clears throat> the political uh, one side. And when I say political, that is the search for power in the Federation. And certainly the third was religious. Um, the North used Islam. Almost the same sort of thing that we're witnessing in Europe today. Um, might you take this opportunity to state very clearly the solidarity of Ndibo, that is the Igbo people, with the United States, her government, in the events of September 11th. Naturally, we feel with America, and I am personally proud of our solidarity. All we say is this is an extension of that for which we have suffered as suffering and will continue to suffer if the world does not come to our aid. We pray that, that somehow the United States gets out of this. We are sure anyway that she will vanquish the enemy. But I would like her also to remember that in her pain, we showed solidarity. Yeah, that's uh, uh, AZ was speaking on behalf of all Igbos everywhere in the world that uh, the uh, sympathy is with the United States of the, because of the events of uh, September 11, 2001. The final question, we have about two minutes, Your Excellency. When the Igbos, through the Consultative Assembly, mandated you to declare the Igbo land the sovereign and independent state of Biafra, Nigeria declared war on the young republic. Why would we call this war the war of genocide? The world would like to know again through this medium why the war was called war of genocide against the Igbos. The word genocide is so large in its meaning that even when you're staring it in the face very often you hesitate about using the term. But actually, the Biafran problem was nothing except being genocidal. There was no distinction. The mere fact that you were an Easterner in those days labeled you fit only for one thing, death, and death at the hands of the Nigerian authorities. The Igbos and their associates were killed in practically every village in northern Nigeria. They were killed in many places in western Nigeria. They were killed in Lagos, even on Kata Bridge, the very center of Lagos. People were looked at and they thought, oh, this looked an Igbo, and killed. The very first army officer killed in Lagos, actually, during that time was um, uh, from Calabar, was killed on, um, on the bridge, and so on. Igbos were being hunted out and killed. The Igbos that remained in Lagos after the war began were herded together and detained without any trial or anything, no question of any legal rights, Till today, property of Igbos are still sequestered in various areas of Nigeria, and they have not been released, not all of them, uh, to um, the Igbos, the original owners. Oh no, we're quite certain. In fact, the only reason it is not called or not accepted as genocidal is because of the Cold War. At that time, 
anything ethnic based was almost like uh, an insult to humanity. And uh, ethnicity became a term of abuse in politics. That's all. If it were today, certainly, what happened in Nigeria is much, much worse than what you have seen of Rwanda, not to talk about Eastern Europe. Your Excellency, we have come to the end of the program. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the enlightenment. Thank you for your patience. Um, thank you for watching African Affairs, a DC TV program on Africa in Washington, DC, United States of America. Our guest today um, is His Excellency Ezi Ibo, uh, General Chukwemeka Odumegu Ojuku. We thank you for being in our program. It's an honor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now you can relax and watch African music video. Thank you again for watching.